Good morning, everybody. Wake up. Wake up, wake up. In Provincetown. This week featuring. Wake up, wake up. Can I have some coffee? Wake up, wake up. Make it strong, please. Hey! Oh! Hey! Wake up, wake up! Oh. <laughs> Wee! No, really, can I have some coffee? Wake up, wake up! Wake up, wake up! Good morning, everyone. <laughs> oh, hey, everybody. It's Friday, March 22nd. This is our first show of spring. I know. That's very exciting. You look very springy. I feel very springy, except for the fact that all of my digits are about to fall off because it is 27 degrees outside. You look springy slash you washed all your whites with a red shirt. Thanks. I know how to do laundry. It's just like that shade of pink. Is but it looks great. It's the lighting in I already here. told you I like it. Thank you. Is this going to be that kind of show? It's always that kind of show. You guys, we have a really fantastic show for you today. Harry, tell everybody what's happening. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, we stopped by the police station. We got a, an advanced viewing of the police station. A private little tour with yeah. Deputy Police Chief Greg Hennick and Senior Project Manager Braden Witt of the DPW. They showed us around. Um, it's a re I'm so glad that it's finally done. Mm. It's a really beautiful space. I like walking around in there. Didn't you feel like, do I need to change careers? Yeah. I want to work in here. I want to chill in this climate controlled, beautiful building. I want my desk Not to go. Chill. Ooh, Obviously you're working ooh. as a police like, person. Why doesn't this go up and down? Charlie. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was fantastic. I can't wait for you guys to see it. Yeah. Especially if you weren't at the ribbon cutting, which was the next day, which was really real. There were hundreds of people there. I know, I drove by, it was wild. I forgot it was happening and drove by like right at noon. Yeah, and I wish I had inserted a little clip of the uh, school children singing the mm -hmm. national anthem. It was so adorable. Yeah. Like all the parents craning over each other to try to record it. Like there's my kid right there in the front. I love being reminded that children are a part of our community. Yeah. Because I forget sometimes. Oh my God, what are you talking about? Well, Good I, thing we have the school superintendent here to correct your view <laughs> of Promisetown not having children well, in no, it. Well, no, I mean, it's just when you're haunts are like wave bar and porch and bar and the brewery it's like there's not a lot of kids around little kids don't come play trivia with you no they don't no <laughs> um we also have a, perf a special performance um mark bean and his band M mjt mjt i almost said mtg tmj no, no is that what you were calling it no marjorie taylor green no, stop it no um but that's really exciting i'm, I'm looking forward to that great um, we also are talking about Mata Field. I know, our annual visit with town manager Alex yeah. Morris is today to catch mm -hmm. us up on the town warrant. Um, but first, how was your week? It was really cute. I was very busy. Yeah? Yeah, so last week... After Losing that tournament? We'll get there. Okay. Um, <laughs> last week after the show, I worked here at the brewery and then ran home, changed really quickly, and then me and Bob and Sam ran over to the Commons to support the Pond Hill Chapel a fundraiser mm -hmm. um, and that was really really special it made it really felt like a, a the whole community coming together and it made me feel really good and a lot of money was raised that yeah. night they have until april 1st to raise four hundred thousand dollars i think mm -hmm. it is still it's a tall order i think it's slightly after april 1st because i know the harbor lounge is going to donate all of their profits from the first day open and i think that's not till april 4th so Hopefully it's sure. a flexible deadline from yeah. the landlords. Maybe. I think once they realize the outpouring of community support, they might reconsider that deadline. Yeah. We'll see. We shall see. Um, but everyone who spoke was incredible. Um, the food was amazing. Mm -hmm. You had a chicken. How was it? Chicken was delicious. Yeah. Um, obviously, we're trying to raise money, so I shared the feed to Community Space. Mm -hmm. And this is this is separate. I don't want to mar the event. This is just my personal experience with what happened. Um, but the event was amazing. Happy, joyous community coming together. Awesome. But I posted the feed onto Community Space because I wanted as many people to see it as possible because we're trying to raise money. And not five minutes later, I got a message on Facebook Messenger. Mm -hmm. And it was basically this woman being like, 
Um, as someone who believes in God and is a Christian, obviously I love everyone, but just so you know, the Bible says you're going to hell. Okay. And I was like, okay. Um, so I responded. Um, I said, what's more Christ-like? Me spending my Friday night um, helping to save a chapel or sitting on your couch on a Friday night harassing people on Facebook Messenger? And she, <laughs> and she responded, she said, I'll have to put some some thought into that. Sorry that you feel harassed. I'm like, and it was very like, um, as a Christian, <laughs> I obviously love everyone. And I feel like a lot of times people say- Is it obvious? Yeah, If you're right. gonna like be sending people messages like that. But that's that. what I mean. I feel like a lot of people who are religious, who who have this idea of like, oh, I love everyone because I'm religious and then do things like that. I feel like they think they don't understand that um, not to like love is love, but like there's only kind of one definition of love. Mm -hmm. And if like, if you think about the people in your life that you do love, your mother, your siblings, your partners, your friends, mm -hmm. if you wouldn't treat them in that way, you, don't, you can't treat other people that way, but be like, oh, but I still love you. Like how you would treat the people, if you're gonna be, I'm Christian, I love everyone, you have to treat everyone the way you treat the people you love. And to the person who sent him that message, if you only knew that he was going to hell for a host of other reasons. Yeah, there's so many reasons, yeah, exactly. Not the least of which is because he's Honestly, gay. yeah. This hairline, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> this flawless hairline. Um, yeah. But, uh, once again, it was a, a great a night. Really amazing, amazing night. And I think they're going to hit their goal. Mm -hmm. I hope so. I yeah. think so too. Um, then I watched Drag Race. Great episode. Um, is Shangela, not Shangela, I'm sorry. Is <laughs> Safira still on it? Safira is still on it. The interwebs are saying she's the winner. Like it's going to happen. She's Isn't there. that so nice? Yeah. I hope so. P How many people are uh, five or six, I think. Okay, I'll start watching. Yeah, it and it, but bummer, everyone's also saying that my favorite is going to go home this week. Oh, who's yeah. your favorite? Her name is Morphine from our house. Oh, <gasps> Morphine is still there? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, tell her that I love her. I will tell her that. <laughs> Perfect. Um, she was one of those girls that kind of came on, and I, I thought she was kind of just going to be like catty and both, and she is a little, but, but she also is like, she's very talented, very sweet, um, She's kind of the narrator of the season. Mm -hmm. I like I like her a lot. She's cool. Yeah. Little catty, but ultimately lovable. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. I mean, that's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. Um, but um, we'll have to get them here. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm going to see them uh, this weekend. Yeah. Oh, oh nice. I'm going to the Our House Drag Brunch this Sunday. Okay, you have to. Okay, I will talk to her about it. Yeah, please. I can't even get Rocco to come up here. How am I going to get all one of those drag queens to come up here? Get Rocco up here. I know and Rocco's tell him watching this morphine. right now. Yeah. Rocco, bring morphine to Prince. I love this so much. <laughs> um, and also, I hope Safira comes back for a little back to P Town this summer. That would be lovely. Yeah, yeah that'd be really special. Um, you have a lot of fans here, Morphine and Safira. You do. Yeah. Um, Not Shangela. We'll, we'll jump into a quick news story. Five people accused Shangela of sexual assault over this past week. Um, as a person who lives in queer communities, there have been rumblings of this for quite some time. They are alleged accusations, but oh, seemingly um, she is a predator. Do you want to talk about this yet? Not yet. Okay. Um, so <laughs> Sunday I came to the brewery. It was St. Patrick's Day. Did you wear your green? I did. I only wore green underwear so that when people went, you're not wearing any green, I could take out my underwear. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but I came uh, to the brewery for the Babes and Boys St. Patty's Day Feast. It was incredible. Sam, you did such a good job. The food was amazing. I, what were the little balls called? Irish? The Irish potatoes. Oh. Yeah. This, like the sweet ones? Yeah. They're Irish potato candy. But... Irish potato candy. It's like coconut, confectioner, sugar, cinnamon. Is there any potato in it? No. <laughs> They look like, I guess because they're rolled in cinnamon, they look like little potatoes. They were so good, and I had access to them, and I shouldn't have. <laughs> it was literally like I would eat one, and they were so sweet, and I've been really limiting my sugar lately. Mm -hmm. So I would eat one. My stomach would get a little upset because I'm not used to eating so much sugar lately. And then the moment my stomach would settle and not be upset anymore, I would have another one. And my stomach would get upset, and I just continued this cycle. You're describing childhood. Hmm. Yeah, I guess you're right. Don't go back to the table. I'm a young person. Oh my God. 
Um, but it was it was really great, a big fundraiser for Babes and Boys. They do so much for the town, so I was happy to be here and support. And it was really successful. A ton of fun people were here. It was awesome. Um, and in that, while I was here, we hatched a little plan to come back the next day. The brewery was closed, but I brought my switch in, invited some people. You were trying to get a leg up on this tournament. I was trying to help everyone else practice. Oh, is and that they, what you were doing? And they needed to. No, I'm just kidding. It did? did it really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, we had about 15 people here just chilling. Um, Sam and Carmen uh, uh, prepared the leftovers from the day before. It was re it was another really awesome community. It felt really cute. Good. Yeah. Um, didn't help you win, though. That brings us to Tuesday. Um, I've been talking a big game for quite some time about winning the Mario Kart tournament, and I do have a trophy. What place is it? It is third? How do you say it? I, I, third? Third? Did you place third? I, I've never heard of it, So, um, but unfortunately, I did get third place. It was such a fun event. Kristen, Giselle did such a good job. The Crown and Anchor did such a good job. It was wild playing Mario Kart on that gigantic screen. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of people I knew were coming, a few new faces, um, and it was awesome. Do you want the rundown of what happened to me? What I want to yeah, I want to know who beat you and how you lost um, in great detail. So perfect. How much time do we have? <laughs> half an hour. Perfect. Um, Mark's like we don't have half an hour. Um, so it was bracket style. There mm -hmm. were four bracket. Four people can play at a time. There were sixteen players, so there were four rounds to start. Mm -hmm. Two people move forward from each round. Then right. so that goes to two brackets to one bracket, right. and that's how it goes. Um, the first round, I did win my round in first place. It was great. Um, so I moved on to the next round. Mm -hmm. uh, each next round had someone that I didn't know that was did really, really well. Mm. Um, so I got nervous at that point. Like I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to beat these people. Um, the the guy who played this in who won the second round really, really won. Like he won by a lot more than I did. Um, so I was like, yikes, I'm nervous. But then so and he was in my second round. Mm. Um, his name was Zeb. He is a bassist who plays with Mike Flanagan at Tim Pan oh. Alley on Wednesdays. So mm -hmm. he, me and him were in the second round. I was like, I think I can at least get second and move on, but my goal is to win. And include one, one of the other guys in my round goes to me, best we could hope for is second, right? And I was like, no. And I won that round. You did. Yeah, I got first place in that round, beat Zeb. Um, he got second just behind me. Um, me and Zeb moved on. Um, two other people moved on to the final round of four. I... The three, there were three people that were very, very neck and neck. Mm -hmm. And I, going into the last race, I was behind. And with just a bit left in the final lap, I finally pulled ahead into first place. And if you don't know the game that well, there's items that you get that help you. And there is one specific item called the blue shell. Mm -hmm. And basically the blue shell is whoever fires it off, it goes all the way to the front and automatically hits the person in first place. Ooh. I pulled into first, exactly. <laughs> I pulled into first place, not less than three seconds later, blue shell fell into fourth place and got knocked out. Cost you the tournament. Yeah. Oh. I know, I know. And after all that shit you talk. I know. But, um, so the two first players from that round moved on to play against each other and for the win, um, Zeb won like I, Z Zeb ended up winning, but I did beat him in the second round. So I did beat him, just not when it mattered. Right. So I feel like I had a, I had a, I'm proud of myself. I had a good showing. <laughs> the, the, the two other guys that beat me are incredible players, but I do feel like on any given day, the three of us could have been in any order. They were really fantastic as am I. I guess we won't know until next year. Exactly. Well, I got both of their numbers because they were really fantastic and I like I mean, let's let's get together and play, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Zeb was just as confident as I. I know a lot of people are like, you are so cocky, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's the name of the game. It's mm -hmm. Mario Kart. And even the gentleman who got second place, his name was Dylan. They, him and his brother came and played together. His brother didn't make it quite as far, but his brother was sitting probably 10 feet behind him in a chair watching and just ragging on him the entire time. Like, oh my God, I can't believe you missed that. Oh, what a bonehead move. And I'm like, that. I learned this game growing up playing with my brother mm -hmm. and my sister. And that's just how it works. You should talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, I'm very happy to have gotten third place. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, hats off to Summer of Sass, Kristen Becker, Giselle, the Crown and Anchor, and Providence Brewing Company for putting together such a great event. 
and I look forward to more. Well, while you were busy playing video games all week, I was doing very important work supporting our community. When? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I had a great time on St. Patrick's Day as well. My friends Mary and Brian were playing at Tin Pin Alley from two to five. And while they were, Mary Callanan, very Irish lady, yeah, yeah. bright red yeah, hair, yeah. Um, while she's standing there, saying multiple uh, people from the Catholic Church walked in in like full green regalia. Like, Work. I know, like big, tall hats, cloaks, robes, you know what I'm saying? It's drag, honey. I, I should have put a picture in here for you. But I mean, Mary was like, this this feels planned. I'm like, Good. look, everybody loves cute. you. Everybody yeah. loves them. And then Monday night, of course, I went to, um, the VMCC to hear the preliminary, not preliminary, they've been working on this Mata Field project for a long time. This was my first time to attend a meeting to hear people talk about it. And um, was it, it well attended? I feel like people are interested in this project. People are very passionate about it. Um, a lot of important questions were, at, like, you know, I'm sitting there going, all I wanted to know is like, if I go to play tennis, is there, is there something covering me? Like I'm a professional tennis player? You know, is there yeah, somewhere is, for me does to the sit? When, where does the retractable dome? <laughs> And then it goes down into the ground. I don't think they have that yet. Not yet. Um, but uh, yeah, I can't wait to talk to these guys about mm. this. Exciting. Yeah, and then of course I went to the ribbon cutting that you missed, mm. which was delicious. Liz made sandwiches from Angel Foods. Ooh. So many people there. It's so nice to see everybody getting together for something positive. And um, my favorite part of it, aside from the kids singing, was when they took the flag from the old police station and gave it to the oh, old police chief. That's sweet. I know, it was like a passing of the torch because he's been trying to get this to happen for a very long time <clears throat> and it finally did. And as you can hear me say, I told you so in our little interview with Greg Hennick and Braden, I told you guys so. <laughs> if we had voted yes, when this only cost a couple million dollars, people wouldn't be complaining now about how much it ended up costing. Yeah. And that's just the way things go. So, and I don't like to be that person that says I told you yes, so all the you time. Do. You love I, that. I, I thrive, <laughs> I live there, I live and I told you so, and I did. Yeah. So um, it's nice to see it finally come to fruition. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do anything else this week? Um, just made dinner for some friends oh, the other night. Sweet. Yeah. Um, I also hosted trivia last night. It was tons of fun. Rebecca Orchant was my co-host, <gasps> the Duchess of Sandwich herself. Ah, yeah. What was her round on? So her round was on sandwiches, her question round was on sandwiches, and her other, her visual round was on bombshells, uh -huh. like classic bombshells that inspired her burlesque work. People were complaining that the sandwiches round was too difficult? Um, some people, it's hard. There's such a vast range of, I don't want to say intelligence, but- Knowledge. Knowledge, knowledge. in the room. Right, thank you for like, that. Some of my, like my Said round- Said the person who won last night. <laughs> some. One person, one group that did my round only even filled in two of the answers and one of them was wrong. And then there were three teams that got every single point on the round. So it's hard, it's so hard to write for everyone. Yeah, you know? it is hard to write yeah. for everyone. But Rebecca did a fantastic job. I was like, I love how your two rounds are like titties and sandwiches. She's like, that's pretty much the name that's of my life. autobiography. That's her brand. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it was it was really fun. We had a really good crowd in here. Was there a night. question on Rubens? No. It's my favorite sandwich. I learned a lot about sandwiches. <laughs> like, did you know the food item sandwich and the town sandwich on the Cape are named after the same thing? The sandwich? Yeah. No, the, the place sandwich <laughs> in the UK. Sandwiches are called sandwiches because the guy who invented sandwiches was the Duke of Sandwich. Earl. 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 Sorry, I got that the one The Duke wrong. of Earl? <laughs> no, the Earl of Sandwich. Oh. So therefore, he invented them, and that's why they became called sandwiches. Mm -hmm. And the town on the Cape is named after that town. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Yeah, someone needs to open a sandwich shop in Sandwich called Sandwich Sandwiches. No. Sandwich Square. Yeah, or um, a churro shop in Truro. Churros, churros. No. Yeah, come on. No. Churros, churros. You, no. Churros, East Ham's. Churros. East Ham's hams. We, can we move on to the next segment of this show, please? Sure, <laughs> I guess. But um, definitely tune in, uh, come to trivia next week. I'm not going to be hosting. I'm taking a little break. Evan is going to be back. He's been gone for a few weeks. And Kristen Becker is going to be hosting. Oh, that. that's going to yeah. be fun. That's rounding out our month of having um, the brewery's favorite favorite women be our co-hosts. It was Excellent. awesome. Good one. Yeah. Um, another thing happening at the brewery, um, we are doing March Madness here at the brewery, but we are highlighting the women's tournament. And we're going to be showing all the women's games here on the, our brand new projector. It looks really amazing. It's going to be a ton of fun. I'll definitely be here for all the UConn games because those are my girls. 
Um, but they are doing a bracket tournament. I think the link is in the bio. If it's not, you can get it on the Provincetown Brewing Company's Instagram page. If you click the link on their Instagram bio, it'll take you to our like little tournament grouping. Fill out a women's bracket. Um, come watch all the games with us. It's going to be tons of fun. Gambling? Um, first prize is $200 gift card to the brewing company. Second is 100 and third is $50. Hey. Yeah. And there is so much really exciting characters and things happening in women's basketball right now mm-hmm. um there's caitlin clark um there's players on lsu that are amazing like it's it's really fun there's a lot of like stars in it it's gonna be fun yeah, yeah. support women's sports come here support the brewery hang out learn about women's sports if you're not, ha- not into them it's really exciting i feel like as a gay community it's like our job to support women's sports you know mm-hmm. yeah Oh, by the way, you guys, if you are somebody who enjoys recreational shell fishing, it ends on April 1st. Today, low tide is at 453. It's Mm -hmm. nice and sunny, but it is a little chilly. You might want to layer up Mm -hmm. if you're going clamming. And if you have any leftover, you can drop them off on my front porch. They'll stay cold and fresh out there. And eaten. Yeah. You haven't made me any clam chowder this winter. I didn't? No. Hmm. Interesting. All these other people you make clam chowder for, you don't. Oh, last night I made vongole. Vongo. You don't love me. So good. Um, so good. One more thing, and then we're going to go to Babes and Boys. Um, Joao Santos is having a show this Saturday night along with Andrew Sharanian called um, My Heart Belongs to Daddy at D-Bar. So if you are in Boston this Saturday night. Tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Um, make sure to scoop up a ticket. It's going to be tons of fun. Um, the ticket, I think, is $79, but it does include a three-course meal from D-Bar. which Dinner and a show. The yeah. food there is excellent. Excellent. Um, so yeah, tomorrow night, eight o'clock is the show. Get your tickets now. It's gonna be amazing. It's Joao, it's our little baby. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, should we do Babes and Boys now? Awesome, take it away, find out everything going on. What's up everyone? This is Sam with the Babes and Boys Weekly Roundup and starting off on Friday. Provincetown Brewing Company bringing you Women's March Madness. You can enter their bracket pool through their link on their Instagram and all picks must be submitted by Friday at 11.30 a.m. Get in now. And then there's gonna be some test classes thrown by the Helltown Fitness Cohort over at the Crown and Anchor. That's 5 p.m. on Friday and 9 a.m. on Saturday. Go get them some free classes that they're testing before the summer. And Fellow Friday is happening at the Fine Arts Work Center this Friday. It's always a great time. Check them out at Falk Fine Arts Work Center. Check it out. And then there's a community pasta party with Tony Pascal, Raina Stefani, Liam Luttrell, Roland, and they are raising money for the Toro Centro School Garden Fundraiser. Also, it's Friday Night Float Charts, and this time Giselle and Jake are taking over instead of Brittany and Clint over at the Crown and Anchor. But other than that, it's pretty much the same. On Saturday, there's a special screening of Period of Adjustment, Tennessee Williams' first great comedy of by the Tennessee Williams Fest over at Water's Edge Cinema. And then you can celebrate Tennessee Williams' 113th birthday over at the Crown and Anchor at 2 p.m. Then there's a doggy adoption from 12 to 4 over at the Black Dog. Lots of dogs, lots of cuties. Go check that out. And later on, True Love's Kiss is going to be happening. Uh, you can RSVP um, at the link mentioned right here, miguelbraselli.com slash RSVP. It will take place over at the Breakwater. That's sure to be a really good time, 6 p.m. Also on Saturday night at 7, there's a Mosquito Story Slam, and this time the prompt is Stroke of Genius, so come with your stories. Then on Sunday morning, there's a watch party with Love Lies Bleeding, as in collaboration with Water's Edge Cinema and Babes and Boys, in an effort to spread the buzz about Lesbian Visibility Week. Then on Monday, Language Exchange has happening at the Commons, with English, Spanish, and some Portuguese too. And on Tuesday, figure drawing is still going strong over at the Gifford House. This week's model is Rick. Tuesday also has game night with Giselle. Giselle just led a very fun Mario Kart. Thanks in collaboration with Summer of Sass. It was a really fun time. Sorry for your third place, Harrison. Also on Tuesday, the Provincetown Theater is bringing you Singing in the Rain for their sing-along movie night. And if you haven't been before, it's a really good time. So I will see you there. And on Wednesday, there's an experimental night with Keb and the Holograms. Keb, the winner of the Mario Kart racing tournament over at Tin Pan Alley. 
And to round out the week, Taproom Trivia is bringing Kristen Becker on board to round out the Women's Month trivia that's been happening all month long. It's been a great time. And if you have anything you'd like to see over here at the Weekly Roundup, please email us at babesandboys at gmail.com. And if you don't and you just want to say hi, you can also do that too. See you out there on these streets. Bye. Compost is live at the Provincetown Transfer Station now. Um, so town residents that have a transfer station ticket can now drop off food scraps for composting at the transfer station, which is really exciting. Mm -hmm. So it has to be in a brown paper double brown paper double bag, mm -hmm. which I'm not exactly sure what that is. Two brown paper bags. Oh. A paper bag inside of a paper bag. Okay. I wasn't sure if it was like a special thing. <laughs> so you can use like see like stop and shop yeah. bags. Oh good, that's great. Um, or green compostable bags. Mm-hmm. Or you can just dump it straight into the thing. Whoa. I mean, I imagine you would have like a little pail in your kitchen or something. Yeah. And then you take it, you dump it, and then you bring it back and refill it. Mm -hmm. um, like what you have. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you can bring, obviously, food scraps, coffee grounds, and also food-soiled paper products, which I didn't realize. Mm. Um, so obviously, this is going to be a, a contractor would then pick it up because there are ways that people, like, there's two types of compostable items. There's like things that say compostable doesn't necessarily mean you can throw it in your backyard and it will break down. They have to be composted in a specific facility, which is the contractor that will be picking it up, which is why I imagine that, that you can bring in food soiled paper products because mm -hmm. they can do that. Don't throw your food soiled paper products into your backyard. That's littering. Um, but, and then they will turn that compost into um, really great soil that will then be used in agricultural land. Do you have one of those things? I do. You do? Yeah. Yeah. I also, I made my compost bucket out of like just a big galvanized trash can. You poke some holes in the bottom so it can have some airflow and you just, I put a bungee cord over the top and every once in a while, because Mark said he has one that you just crank. I just knock it over, roll it around in my backyard and then stand it back up and put it back where it goes. Technology. Technology. I'm just, I'm like a homesteader. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, also, I think it was two weeks ago in front of the select board, um, this is a new story, we were talking about the police station and question on everyone's mind. Um, when the this, old police station? What, we, yeah, we were talking about the new one. Question on everyone's mind now is what is going on with the old police station property. Um, Christine Barker had a proposal to um, for her plans. She had introduced them already in July, but this was kind of an update. Um, and. She hopes to begin construction in spring of 2025. Um, the estimated cost of the project is 17 million, which is up 28% from the estimation in July. And this goes to your point that you had made about the police station is like, things don't get cheaper. No. Every minute that goes by, things are getting more expensive. Um, except for wages. <laughs> ah! Except for the minimum wage. Um, <laughs> uh, so studios that in July were listed as of planning on being between 1675 and 2000 are now going to be between 2175 and 2500. Two bedrooms are now 2850. Um, and just like the high end of that studio price being at 2500, um, based on the common understanding of what affordability is when it comes to housing costs, which are basically um, a, your housing costs should roughly be a third of your income. And at uh, $2,500 for a studio, I'm guessing that would be one person, maybe a couple. But if it's one person, that one person would have to make $90,000 a year in order for that to be considered affordable under current standards of housing affordability, mm -hmm. which I know there are town employees who make that much money, but I don't think there's a lot of people working in town who make that much money. Mm -hmm. And not that these units are going that need to be people who work in town. Not everything being built has to be for people living and working in town, but obviously that is the goal and the hope mm -hmm. that as apartments get built, the people who will be living there are people who are part of the community, living here, working here. But I 
um, there's there's some as things are getting more expensive and like I said, wages aren't necessarily going up. There's this chasm between what's affordable and what what people can afford, where people can live. And I understand that this is how much these places have to cost in order for the project to be viable. Mm -hmm. But then if it, if, I mean, I'm making assumptions here, I didn't do a study or anything, but like what I would expect is that I imagine most of these units will end up being inhabited by people who aren't working in town, making their money. Mm -hmm. Yes. That sounds like a safe bet to me. I mean, yeah. we're gonna see. Yeah, we'll see. And and it's just it go. I'm. I mean, I made a point last year about like what it means for a community when the people living and working here can't afford to be here anymore, and what that what that means for the future of a community. And this is just like another example of like what is going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll see. Right. Well, I mean, market rate is it's sort of a nebulous term. Yeah. You know. Like, and, and, and also they're, they're, the median income in town isn't only based on people who are making money in town. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you live here full time, you're a resident and you work for American Express and you work from your computer in your living room all day and you have a $200,000 salary, that is part of median income. But it doesn't necessarily reflect the community of workers here. Right. Yeah. True. It's it's like you said. It's this nebulous, weird problem with some, and as problems are being created, there's this widening gap, and I don't have a solution. Neither do I. I don't know if anyone does. We'll see. We'll see. Um, that's all I got. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's check out our police station tour. Yeah, you guys. Uh, Deputy Chief of Police Greg Hennick and uh, Braden Witt of the DPW showed us around. We had a really fun time in there with those guys. And I, I don't. I was saying to Sam before we started the show. I don't know that I've experienced the like new building smell for such a sustained amount of time. I was like, this place smells so new. I know. Get in there before. I mean, don't get in there. Don't get thrown in there. But like, go in there and pay them a visit. I, I was like, I hope this is the only time I'm here. Take we'll it away. see. <laughs> Good morning, everybody, you guys. We're in the brand new Provincetown Police Station with Deputy Police Chief Greg Hennick and Senior Project Manager for the Department of Public Works, Braden Witt. You guys, thank you so much for making time to show us around. Yeah, you. you guys yeah. don't know this, but this is before the ribbon cutting. We're seeing this before anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> when is the ribbon cutting tomorrow? Uh, Wednesday, March 20th at noon. Oh, wow. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> How's, how long have you been with the police department here in Provincetown? So I've been here since 2011, which is about 13 years full time. I'm surprised we haven't met. I guess it's just because I'm so good. <laughs> <laughs> and how, long, when, how did you get brought into the project? Uh, I started with the DPW in January 2022 as the facility manager, and this was my first project. So your job extends beyond just the singular project? Yes, uh, I was behind painting the new library, painting the library, and so all the little kinds of weird improvements around town fall under my role. That's fine. But this has been the last two years of your life. Yes, this has been this has been every day for two years. Yeah. It seems like it was a fun project, though, to build something this grandiose, this beautiful. Yeah, this is this has been a, a definite pleasure. We've had an incredible design, engineering, and contract with this project. So it's fun to harken back to the history of Provincetown building big, bold buildings like Town Hall and the Library. So it's nice to be able to put a permanent mark on town. Yeah. Um, should we check out the dispatch room? Yeah, let's head on in. So Greg, tell us a little bit about this state-of-the-art dispatch room. What, how does it compare to the old one? So right now, um, they sit at a desk. We have an external up and down um, desk, raisable desk. This just one, <laughs> yeah, one station. So we do have two stations at the station at the uh, police department now, um, but we don't have the ability to raise and lower. It's not climate controlled. Um, it, yeah, there's there's no operator preference um, as opposed to this. This station is state of the art. All the um, new stations have it, and we are so far behind the times um, with this. So um, we're very happy about this. Our telecommunicator staff are very happy about this. Um, and let me show you how it works. So, like I said before, uh, this whole station can go up <laughs> and down. The desk can go up oh, and wow. down. The 
lighting situation is good here. We have fans, we have heat. So whatever the telecommunicator is feeling that day, they have options now. Oh, wow. And I imagine it's long shifts here answering phones. So it's, it's great that they can be as comfortable. There's, you took every opportunity to make them as comfortable as possible. Absolutely. It seems like all of the upgrades were meant to make somebody's work life a little less miserable. <laughs> or a little more enjoyable, however yeah. you want to put that. <laughs> right, yeah. As I said right now, the telecommunicators don't have that flexibility. Um, you sit at your desk or you're standing. But again, this um, external thing that goes up and down, it's not the whole station. It's very um, cumbersome um, to make it work. So. This is going to um, be great for them. Yeah, and this is also the, the liaison between the police force and citizens. So the quicker things happen, it's important. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. And the um, everything has been transferred to the digital radio system. So right now it's just the press of a button to transfer calls, uh, to broadcast, to unlock doors. It's very um, centralized to so make everything easier for the telecommunicators and faster. You guys check out this brand new roll call room. The Crown Sound Police Department has never had one of these, but it's exactly what you see on TV all the time. Look, look around. <laughs> one, three, two, one. So one of the biggest reasons that you wanted to make a new police station was to kind of upgrade the facilities for the people who work here. And one of the biggest examples of this is this gorgeous locker room. Tell us a little about the upgrades that have happened here to make it super comfortable. Um, I think one of the biggest upgrades, and I think one that the building committee and everyone involved in the project was most proud about, are these great, incredible new lockers. Um, at the current station, it's more of kind of a coat hook on a piece of plywood. So now you've got somewhere down at the bottom, a nice place to put all your boots, rain gear, that kind of stuff. We've, ventilation moves through, mm -hmm. so your uniform stays dry, keeps any you know, mold from growing, any of the, the bad stuff that's happening that's in the station now. Are. And it kind of gives everyone a home base to store stuff in the station. Yeah. When they come, they got a charger on the top so you can plug in your phone while you're changing and all that. So they're very um, decked out with the officers totally in mind in the space. Yeah, and like a little uh, important stuff. Yep. Nice. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about budget, you guys have not gone over budget with this. We project. are not over budget. We did not have to go back to town for more money. <laughs> yeah. For the record, I was voting yes on the police station all the way back when it was like six or seven million dollars. If you guys had voted yes then, it wouldn't have cost what it costs now. <laughs> Great. <laughs> We are in a holding cell. Bob's in trouble. He's trying to get it. I didn't do it. <laughs> Okay, so the police station is so beautiful, great work. Um, but I imagine, I can't imagine what it would be like in the summer, full swing, everyone's here. What will, what will the goings on be like once everyone's in here? So once everybody's in here, uh, we're gonna have the whole uh, telecommunicator, excuse me, telecommunicator section up and running. There may be one or two people working in there. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna have at least two or three officers on duty at one time, so they'll be, um, on the road mostly, mm -hmm. but in here as well, writing reports and uh, doing having roll call and um, maybe even in the cell block. Um, and then upstairs we have the admin wing, which is gonna be our admin staff, me included, with the chief of police and a few uh, civilian employees working up there, making the whole thing run, so. Wow. Yeah. So is it about 35 employees total, everyone? Just about, yeah. Wow. And what you guys didn't see, a lot of the upstairs space, and down here too, I mean, there's a lot of natural light coming in. Mm -hmm. So it feels like kind of a happy place yeah. to go to work every day. A lot of windows. It's very, yeah. very nice. <laughs> totally. Yeah. totally. Yeah. I mean, I have been in the old one. I'd never stayed there. Mm -hmm. But it was like just like a dark, cramped place. Yeah. You know? Like I wouldn't, it wasn't somewhere that I would like going to work. Right. And I think that's what's so exciting is I think with this brand new police station, we'll be able to have police officers who want to come here and want to have a career here and really invest their time in the community, which I think is so important. Absolutely. I think this is something that the officers really want, and uh, I'm very excited about it as well. Yeah, so, totally. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for chatting with us today. This was really great. Um, congratulations. Thank and, you. I'm excited for everything moving forward here. Thank you. Thank you for serving our community for 13 yes. years and for staying. Like, you easily could have left. <laughs> all those times that the new police station didn't pass, if I were working there, I'd have been like, this place doesn't care about us. I'm going to peace out. And one more thing. What's your yeah. next project? Uh, next big project is at DPW. So we've got sewer expansion ongoing. We broke ground on Cannery Wharf Park on Monday. So right. Cannery Wharf has started, and I know a lot of people have been asking, we're about to pave Standish and Alden Street. Oh, no. uh, oh and we're also about to convert the top of Firehouse 2 into municipal housing. 
So we're adding five rooms for municipal housing up above Firehouse 2 across from Spiritas. Oh, that's right. I'm a little, I'm pushing to move in there so I can get pizza, do a pizza zip line. I thought, what was your one next project? You were like, there's actually 20. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks, so, thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you so much. Smart money on who gets arrested first and thrown into that brand new jail. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I kept being like, well, I've never seen the old one, so... You guys, please welcome to the show school superintendent, Jerry Goyette. And welcome back, town manager, Alex Morse. Good Thank morning. you guys for making some Whoa. time to come visit us. Yeah. So talk to, talk to us about Mata Field, the yeah, redevelopment project. talk to us about project. the scope of the project. What is, what's going to happen? Sure, sure. So um, as school superintendent, I got sucked into the um, committee that had to duke it out for what was viable, what wasn't viable, and we worked with a lot of people to come up with the actual plan that we had. Um, you know, we didn't get everything we wanted, but it was a very inclusive, I think it was a, a very community-based project to try to get everybody idea on the table and to really talk about it. So it's been a lengthy, lengthy, lengthy project to finally come to the table. What are some of the um, things that are going to be added to Mata Field? So Mata Field, you know, when they took away the police, built the police station, so the skate park mm -hmm. dissolved. And uh, now we put the back the skate park, um, pickleball, we expanded a couple of those. We're adding bocce. Um, we're adding a, a track around the soccer field and a little league um, softball, baseball field. Mm -hmm. um, we have some great exercise equipment that's going to be available in the middle. Um, what else, Alex, is on there? Yeah, tennis courts, pickleball courts, the track you mentioned. There's a community plaza, so there can be like outdoor theater, performances. It's also really important to note that the town really hasn't put much money in that park since the 1950s. Mm -hmm. um, it's not accessible, so folks with disabilities really can't get access to the park. Um, and overall, it's really a once-in-a-generation opportunity for the town. Mm -hmm. um, there's people in this community, there's families, there's children that live here now that deserve access to um, a park and a public space like this. And just to let you know, Housen, we have 180 students at the school, uh, <laughs> ranging from three months old up to the eighth grade. And it's, you know, what I look forward to is taking the, the babies out in the strollers and instead of dodging commercial street traffic, we could actually bring them to the track and yeah. go around the track in a nice safe environment. So that'll be really cute. And hopefully, you know, as we're running around the track, there'll be other people who will bump into us and talk about, hey, what's going on? What's going on in the school? And it could be a really nice way to chat up the school. Yeah. It's also uh, like a multi-generational park. So it's not, there's something for everybody at the park of all ages from children, uh, our students, uh, young you know, people aging like folks. You. Um, who, who play tennis, who play pickleball, who do other things at the park. So there really is something for everyone there. Yeah, it's a community resource Yeah, and, and an invaluable one. Mm -hmm. And what we really need is that third athletic season, because right now we have soccer for season one, and then we do basketball, and then we have nothing for the kids that third season. And that's kind of one of the draws that Norset has versus Provincetown, that kids who are athletic and want to do sports well, we only have two out of the three seasons. And so they look at Norset and say, well, I can do something else. And we lose kids that way. Right. And we want to keep all our kids in town. Yeah. So that's what the track's for. So that's what the track's for. Well, also in the in the spring, because it doesn't have great drainage, it gets a little muddy. So you can't have 180 kids running around there. I imagine part of the project will also be mitigating that. Drainage, Alex? things yes. like that. Yeah. <laughs> of course it will. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right um, now, the uh, talking about drainage and stuff, you know, when you play soccer on that field, you have to be very careful you're going to break an ankle because right. there's lots of divots in there. It hasn't right. been really, like, taken care of yeah. the way it needs to take care of. And, you know, the dugouts are a very scary thing for me because I go up to check the dugouts to make sure that the kids will be safe if they end up in the dugouts, yeah. especially during the summertime when we have rec up there. We have to be very cautious. And just to play devil's advocate, because it's one thing to convince a room of 20 people or even us that this is um, a good idea. You're going to be faced with a lot of people on April 1st who are instinctively knee jerk, just going to be like, that's a lot of money. I don't want to do this. Like, what do you say to those people? Yeah. So, I mean, we acknowledge it's, it's an expensive, uh, substantial project uh, for the town. And, you know, I argue that, like I said before, it's a once in a generation opportunity for our community. 
Um, we would have to bond for it over 15 years, and we'll talk about this at town meeting, but for the average homeowner, if your value is around $900,000, you'll see $180 impact per, per year, um, and that assumes no grants. Uh, we're confident uh, and we're in line for a million dollar grant to help offset the cost. We've allocated $200,000 in Community Preservation Act funds, and so we need to get the full authorization from town meeting to advance the project, but as always, town staff will work to mitigate that cost and mitigate the cost to the taxpayers. And as I said, the town really hasn't invested money in this park or public space in years. Um, and we also you know, get this argument that, well, we could be spending that money on housing, we can be spending that money on something else, and you know, we can advance multiple priorities at once. Um, obviously, housing is our number one goal and happy to chat about that more and the number of projects we're advancing when it comes to providing affordable community housing for everybody that lives and works here. Mm -hmm. But we can't also ignore our public uh, you know, safety facilities, our public spaces, our parks. Mm -hmm. It's incumbent upon us to maintain and grow and support a thriving vision for the town. And when you say $180, I mean, if you think about what that means practically, I mean, Mark said it's like a dinner out. And I'm looking at it like if you divide that up over 12 months, it's like that's a Netflix subscription. And maybe instead of watching your favorite Netflix show on a Tuesday afternoon, you can go walk the track or play tennis or, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just like, <laughs> Ethan's going, no. I just, <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? Like you have to think about it as a practical cost and what it offers to the community as a whole. And also you personally, yep. like you're going to be paying your taxes for this, but also you are going to have access to an incredible track incredible tennis courts, pickleball courts, bocce ball, like that's exciting. Yeah, and as Jerry said, we have like over 100 students in our public school system. We wanna support families. Our early learning center is growing and our community deserves this type of uh, this type of park in our community. And we pay it over 15 years, so it's not a permanent adjustment increase in your taxes for until the end of time. It falls off once the project's paid for. And we do have debt falling off in the years to come from projects that were okay. supported in the past. And it's another one of those situations where it has to get approved before you can try to get grant funding. Um, we have a couple of pending grant applications in um, already. Uh, we're expecting to hear in September about the million dollar grant, but we are confident because we got the same grant to go towards the Cannery Wharf project that we broke ground on uh, last week. We can also still apply for more grants, more CPA funds. So again, that $180 figure is sort of the max without grants. Um, for those that own property in Provincetown and live here year-round, they get the residential tax exemption. It's even lower than that. So it's really, like you said, and I appreciate your framing, what the investment is and that it makes sense for people here in the community. Yeah. And Cannery Wharf Park just broke ground. That's all exciting. Yeah. Put a shovel on <laughs> yeah. the ground. And that's a really exciting project. And thanks again to the voters of Provincetown for funding that project a couple of years ago. And yeah, it's been an, an exciting few weeks in Provincetown, just a number of projects that we're moving forward. Yes. I mean, it's kind of in the same spirit of what we were doing last week with the Pond Hill Chapel. It's like, it's it's so important to have safe, comfortable spaces for people to meet and gather. Like that's what community is all about. And not everything can be a bar. You know, we need other spaces to meet and gather to be a healthy, thriving community. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to shift gears to housing? Yeah, always. <laughs> Let's shift gears to housing. Um, uh, we were chatting while we were watching the police yeah. video um, about the project that we were talking about and also some other housing projects yeah. that we've got in the works. Talk a little more about that. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I uh, definitely overheard your conversation. Um, <laughs> I was and, like, you know, as I said before, housing, of course, is our number one priority from the select board to the administration to just everybody in the community. Obviously, it's impossible not to be just given the severity of the housing crisis. Um, but there's a lot of exciting things on the pipeline. Um, <clears throat> in a few months, we're going to break ground at the old VFW, 3 Jerome Smith Road, 65 new permanent year-round affordable rental units. Um, and the focus there is affordable housing. So most of those units are going to be around 80% area median income, which is around someone that makes $65,000 a year um, or below. There will be a handful, about four market units there for mm -hmm. incomes above the 80% AMI. Um, and there's at least a 70% local preference on those units. People that live here, work here, have connections, are, are ties to the community. Um, and what we found at Province Landing, uh, another community builders project, is that over 92% of those that ended up getting housed at the, at the project were Provincetown residents. And there's still a waiting list from that development. So wow. we're confident there's still a need there. Um, the project that you both were talking about at 26 Shang Painter, um, the town recognizes that there are workers and year-on residents here that make more than $65,000 a year um, on average, and that's sort of the moderate income 
market rate, you know, the town invested in Harbor Hill, the 28 units there. Um, but there's a segment of the population that don't qualify for traditional affordable housing, but also don't make enough to buy a million dollar condo. And there's just a not much supply of just year round rentals in general. None really. Um, so at the very least, 20% of those units, and there's 40 units proposed, will have to be affordable um, between 80% and 150% AMI. Um, and we're going to work with the, the developers to try to access other, whether it's local funds, state funds, if there's anything we can do. Because the more subsidies we get for the project, the lower the, the rents can be. Um, we've also expanded our rental assistance program to go up to 100% AMI. Um, and then I would also mention what we announced a couple weeks ago was the, a new uh, pilot program called Lease to Locals. Mm -hmm. um, and with the funding we have so far, we expect to be able to house up to 54 Provincetown residents and workers. Um, the program launches officially on April 1. Uh, we've already gotten a ton of phone calls, emails from property owners, from tenants. Um, and so, I mean, we already have a few like landlords um, confirmed, uh, ready to sign year round right. leases with people that live here and work here. So we're really excited to track that program, inform the community as to how many people we're housing. Um, and it'll be a great problem to have if we have more landlords and more tenants, um, and we just need more funds. And we're happy to go back to the select board and the year on trust. And I'm confident we'll find more funds if there's more need. And that program really is sort of a bridge, right? The VFW project will take about 18 months to build, but we recognize that people are losing their housing now. So this is one of those things to sort of fill the gap. I have a question about the Jerome Smith project. And I hate to be that guy that's playing devil's advocate the whole time, but there is, there's a difference between year round rentals and year round occupancy occupancy. And so like, is there a person who's in charge of making sure that the people who rent it are actually living here? Yes. Um, particularly with town funds and the state and federal funds and the low income tax credits that they're accessing. Um, there's a lot of stringent requirements around year round occupancy, obviously year round leases, and these are permanent, uh, affordable units. And so when the town conveys the property at closing, it's not as if there's absolutely no possibility that they could ever convert to condos, that they right. could be short term rented. Um, you know, obviously, you know, some people here live here year round, but primarily work in the summer, but maybe work part time in the winter. We understand that people may, you know, travel a month in the winter or, or leave right. town and, and, and that's yeah. okay, right? Yeah. Like they, they're still residents here and they call Provincetown their home. And we understand that the, the seasonality of, of work here. So, um, there is enforcement. We work with the community builders and the state funding agencies to make sure of that. Mark has volunteered to knock on every door once a week all year <laughs> to make sure people are really living here. Um, I, I have a, just, I guess, since I have you here, um, when the last year we had a presentation that I attended, um, in front of the select board from, I can't, I think it was Vail or Aspen. Um, and it was about a project that they were having and it was a housing initiative to get more housing for locals and one of the things that i thought was really incredible about that project was a stipulation built into it where everyone who was part of the program had to make at least 70 percent of their income in that location um is was is there any talk about that being applied to any of these projects so that the people who live here, work here in restaurants, our um, medical staff at our Cape, the people who work in town offices, our police officers, our firefighters, like so that they will have a better chance of getting housing? Yeah, so I mean, the technical local preference part of the Three Jerome Smith project and 26 Jane Painter do include like ties to the community. And this came up with the lease to locals program as well. Um, Cause what we didn't want is, oh, there's now all these landlords willing to rent year round. So someone that doesn't live here that may make a decent income move here with the idea that they could take one of those units. And so in the program policies, um, you know, you have to work for a Provincetown business, you have to contribute to the community. You know, if you're an artist, you know, show art, you know, do you work at the commons? Um, are you on a town board or, or commission? So there's ways to, to prove that you're involved. Um, some of the feedback from the select board was that they don't want to exclude people that may have lived here that do work remotely, but you know, they may, you know, bartend part time or um, serve on a town board that they're still part of the community. And so they should qualify for the program. So we do have direct conversations about that. Um, and you're talking about the Vale and Deep program. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially the town um, in that model, the town uh, purchases uh, with town funds, a year round deed restriction right. from the property owner, which essentially guarantees if the property owner doesn't live there year round that they have to rent it to someone year round. And that's typically with no regard to income. And so 26 Shank Painter, for example, 40 units, 100% of those units will be year round deed restricted mm -hmm. that 
somebody has to live there year round. And so no short term rentals, they can't be converted to market condos, things like that. So, you know, one could argue that the per unit subsidy at 26 Shane Painter is for 40 year round deed restrictions as well, even separate from the area median income and uh, affordability options. One more thing, coastal resiliency. Mm. So, I mean, I know that, you, you know, everybody's like, why aren't we spending this money on housing? Like what is, um, what kind of studies are being done and how far along are we in addressing the, the huge problem that's going on on the coast? Yeah, and that's, a, I mean, we won't have a community if we don't invest in coastal resiliency and right. mitigation. And um, town meeting voters a year ago at annual town meeting in 23, allocated $300,000 to go go through a pretty ambitious coastal resiliency planning process. Um, the select board created the coastal resiliency um, commission. They had a joint meeting a, a couple select board meetings ago. Um, they put out an RFP for a consultant. Uh, I think we got upwards of five proposals. The committee started reviewing them last week. And essentially they're gonna be tasked with short, medium and long-term investments and strategies that the town needs to implement. Um, to protect our community. Um, just over the last couple of years, from December of 2022 with that storm, mm -hmm. um, even over the last several months, uh, more flooding in the East End, looking at some of our low-lying areas. You know, Typically, it's been the West End with some of the flooding, now it's more the East End. Um, and so it's a concern to the town. Obviously, there's short-term mitigation things we do and reactionary things, but we really have to start investing in more proactive measures to protect Provincetown, protect the coast, um, and it's going to be expensive, and it's not something the town can afford to do alone. Obviously, we're going to need to rely on our state and federal partners and funding, but um, the town embarking on this planning process is going to include community engagement, stakeholders, things homeowners can do, things the government can do. It's certainly not being being ignored. We know it's going to cost money, um, and we're working towards a plan to address some of those issues. And just a reminder, Things that sound expensive only get more expensive sounding <laughs> later. <laughs> um, one more question back to Mata Field. Are the kids privy to? Oh what? yeah, they they the were a part of the process. Oh, so great. when we had our winter festival, um, the consultant was there. All of the mock-ups were there, and the kids went around with stickies, and they also voiced what they wanted to see, mm -hmm. which was really cool. And they are, since they won't, they obviously they're not registered voters, they won't be at town meeting, but I would imagine their vote is yes, let's do this, right? They are 100% yes, let's do this. So if you vote no, you're voting against children. Oh my God. <laughs> well, and their parents, I mean, parents were there. At our, there were we a lot a, of parents yeah, there on Monday. Meeting, and you were there, thanks for being there. And there was parents and teachers and the athletic director. And I think it was important for other people in the room to see the real life impact this will have on our children, mm -hmm. teachers, parents, and families. And that was really heartening to see. So what you said, remind people that we're still a community, right? We're not just this LGBT tourist destination right. where people have fun for a week. People live here year round. Our year round population mm -hmm. has increased. There's more young people here. We've had to add a third preschool, infant preschool classroom to the community. Um, and at the end of the day, the community designed this park and it's mm -hmm. up to the community as to whether or not you want to invest in it. Yeah. That's great. Any other questions? No. Yeah. You guys, thank you so much for yeah, being here. Thank Good you. luck on April 1st. Yeah. See you soon. I'll see you it's soon. It's going to be a fun one. I know. Yeah. I can't wait to see the soap opera box. <laughs> I can't imagine any screaming and cursing and like that one. There's always some. <laughs> Mary, Mary Jo will have a tight shift. So I'm going to <laughs> uh, I think that's our show today. No, no wait, we, ha we have a performance from MJT. Yeah. But uh, should we wrap it up before we do that? No, we'll wrap We're going to come back yeah. after that? Yeah, okay, yeah. great. You guys, okay. their show is on April 28th. I mean, March 28th at the Grotta Bar. Uh, go down. Mark's a dear old friend of ours, very talented musician. And um, I'm also in love with Todd, so enjoy this <laughs> performance. <laughs> Now that my life is up rearranged, I know that.
You guys, uh, MJT was supposed to be here to perform live, but of course uh, they were not able to do that. Mark had a, a very important doctor's appointment that they had Yay. to attend. Yeah. And um, we wish you the best in health and performance next week. Thank you guys so much for that beautiful number. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, thank you guys for this show. Yeah. Thank you to our sponsors, the Provincetown Brewing Company, the Crown and Anchor, the Boat Slip, Shipwreck at the Brass Key, and also the Provincetown Business Guild. Um, I won't see you guys next week, so have oh, fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Next week, Bob's going to be out of town. I have the incredible Eden Allegretti coming in to co-host with me. I'm so excited. She's one of my favorite people in this town. She's amazing. You're going to fall in love with her, too. Um, we'll see you next week. And, uh, you know, if you're in town on April 1st, go to the town meeting. Definitely. Uh, thank you for waking up in Provincetown. Wherever you are. See you soon. Yeah. Good, Good morning, everybody. Wake up. Wake up, wake up. In Provincetown.